Good evening, and welcome to the San Francisco Public Library. My name is Dee Dee Kramer, Program Manager of the James C. Hormel LGBTQIA Center, and we're delighted to host you here tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to tell you about the center and invite you to come up for a visit. The James C. Hormel LGBTQIA Center holds approximately 10,000 books and 200 archival collections, as well as audiovisual materials, magazines, newspapers, and journals, photographs, and more. By and about lesbians, gay men, and transgender, bisexual, queer, asexual, and gender non-conforming people. We're open to the public seven days a week during regular library hours, so we invite you all to come. A reading room, or what we call our affinity center, is located on the third floor here in the main library in the general collections area, and our archives are upstairs on the sixth floor in the San Francisco History Center. Additional LGBTQIA materials are located throughout the library system and discoverable via the library catalog. We also host a wide range of programs and exhibits about which you can find more information via our website at www.sfpl.org forward slash LGBTQIA or simply pick up a flirtation card at um, our outreach table out in the cafe area. I hope that if you haven't yet, you'll pay us a visit and let us know how we can support you in your work. Thank you so much, Horizons Foundation, and all of you community people for all that you do. I look forward to listening and witnessing and participating in this forum today. Now, here's Horizons President Roger Dowdy to introduce tonight's program. Thank you so much, Dee Dee, and thank you for hosting us tonight. And as you all may have witnessed, I'm having some struggles with this little like microphone thing, so I'm just going to stand here right now um, while I figure that out. Uh, I want to say thank you to you and to uh, the, the James Hormel Center for LGBTQIA, um, uh, LGBTQIA Center, the San Francisco Public Library, and the friends of the San Francisco Public Library, and to all of you for being here uh, with us tonight. Um, I want to say also thank you to this remarkable array of panelists that we have. There are bios in your materials. I'm not going to go through those. Uh, just going from over here to over there, we have Kate Kendall, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, Ray Carey with the National LGBTQ Task Force, Chris Hayashi with the Transgender Law Center, Maria Shudden with Outright Action International, and Brett Andrews with Positive Resource Center. Uh, you may notice there are five of these people up here, and I make six. So there are pluses and minuses to having five people on the panel. The plus is that we get five remarkable, remarkable national, regional, and international leaders in our movement to be with us here tonight. The downside is that there are five of them, and we only have a certain amount of time. And so I'm going to ask forgiveness from the panelists, as well as from everybody here, if I call people to finish up their comments or to get to the question that they're going to ask, uh, because we want to make sure everyone has enough time to talk. So very briefly, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to pose a couple of questions, one general question to the panel, then I'm going to ask a question that's particular to the areas of expertise for each panelist uh, one at a time. And then we have a couple of questions for uh, kind of group discussion among panelists, and then we're reserving at least 30 minutes for questions and answers. We want to make sure that all of you have time to be able to, to pose whatever questions or share whatever thoughts you have within short two-minute blocks at maximum uh, with the panel, and uh, then we'll wrap up. So, sound good? Yeah. All right, so let me start out then with, uh, with a very simple question. Uh, we just had the... We just had the midterm elections, as everybody is aware. Lots and lots of news stories. Not everything has fallen into place as to what happened or what the implications are or even what the result of all the races are. But from where you stand now, from each of you, and, and Brett, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, for your, fruit, for your <laughs> well, A comes first in the alphabet. Uh, and, and just ask you know, each panelist for you know, just a couple of minutes to share what is the top line thing to take away from the midterm results. And you may answer that either in terms of for our movement or on a broader scale for the nation as a whole. Or if you do them both in a couple of minutes, go for all of it. So, Brett? 
you know, my name is Andrews, and I've had to sit in that front seat all of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I got away from that, and obviously I didn't, so here I am. Oh, you've never not liked that. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to go all night long. <laughs> You know, I think uh, for, for those of us who have ebbed and flowed with wanting to watch, who have been overdosing on the news and then have just chosen to just ignore it for our own sanity, uh, I think uh, Tuesday was a bit of a, um, uh, put a little bit more wind in my sail. I, the walk away for me is, and, and Kate and Ray probably know this because I'm such a feminist, Women will probably save us. <laughs> I just, I was so thrilled to see that uh, 100 women are going to step into the House of Representatives. Yes. Uh, this it, it brings in a particular type of dialogue, a more respectful dialogue, uh, ways in which we can engage with each other and compromise and collaborate. Where, frankly, I will just admit, sometimes men just don't do a great job of that. So I'm thrilled, and I'm thrilled to see. People of color stepping up. I think that represents so much of in our movement. LGBTs are stepping into significant roles. Uh, the governorships and, and uh, House of Representatives being uh, represented for LGBTQI. So uh, it was encouraging to me that in these esteemed halls of Congress, that uh, there are some uh, glass ceilings that are being shattered, and uh, it needs to happen at a faster rate and, and a higher percentage. But it gives me a glimmer of hope. Uh, just this past uh, Tuesday. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing people who are, I hope, are more optimistic than, than I feel. Uh, looking at this also from a global perspective, it's like leading up to the election, I saw my friends and colleagues from literally all over the world making comments and expressing their wishes on Facebook for, in relation to the American elections. And, I mean, I wish I could see it more as a clear, flat out rejection of the call for America first. I wish it really was a stronger, like, people first. Uh, but I don't know, I, yes, I, I agree it's, it could have been a lot worse, <laughs> for sure. But I wish it was a little bit clearer, this rejection of nationalism and just look at ourselves, uh, don't care about the rest of the world. So, yeah. <laughs> Please continue to give me optimism. <laughs> Um, well, well, I'll add a little bit of optimism. So I'm, I'm going to take my two minutes to talk about Massachusetts. So. <laughs> folks know there was an anti-trans um, ballot initiative in Massachusetts. Um, it was the first time that our rights as transgender people were voted on at the statewide level. And, uh, and we won, and we won by a lot. And yes. <laughs> um, and, and I will say, like, I have so much appreciation and love for the trans leaders on the ground in Massachusetts who really held that down, for our allies, and for all of the national organizations, like a lot who are represented up here, who went in on that fight, as well as the funders. And I guess I think the lesson that, that I take from that is that I know that win was only made possible because in Massachusetts there have been years and years and years of organizing by trans leaders and our allies in that state to make sure that folks understood who trans people are, knew why our rights were important, and so that win was only made possible because of years and years of building up infrastructure and public and community understanding in that state. Right? So if that had happened in another state where that was not true, we would be in a very, very different place right now. Um, congratulations on Massachusetts. It was incredible. Um, I, you know, I would say um, uh, how this election felt, my grandmother, uh, who lived well into her 90s, used to have this magnet on the refrigerator that said, um, fall down seven times, get up eight. Um, and I actually have it on a bracelet. Year that I've been wearing for uh, the last two years, and I feel like we got up. <laughs> you know, I feel like, um, at least in D.C., it feels like every single day there's just an onslaught of uh, issue after issue that's coming up, statement we have to You know, it's just, it's, it is, the pace of it and the intensity of it and the cruelty of it is just so intense and so 
this election day was not everything we wanted it to be, but it was some of the things that we needed it to be. And I think, you know, a few things stood out for me. Um, grassroots engagement counts. Grassroots engagement counts. We saw that in Massachusetts. We also saw it in Florida. Um, we were working on the Second Chances campaign, working to restore voting rights to those who have been incarcerated. Um, Florida is only one of four states where you can never, ever, ever vote again if you've been incarcerated. Um, there were more votes for that than there were for the governor. So they, that took grassroots organizing, it took faith organizing, it took a lot of people who have been incarcerated, talking to friends and family, uh, and it worked, and it worked, um, and we went on that. Second, um, we, again, uh, something that Brett said, but we've got to run diverse candidates. We don't, at the task force, we don't do that. Our colleagues at Victory Fund and others do that. But we've got to run a diverse set of candidates. And I think what was remarkable this year was how many LGBTQ candidates ran, many of them won, certainly not talking about LGBTQ specific issues. We have a new governor of Colorado who's not going to be the governor of the gays of Colorado. He's going to be the governor of Colorado. So I think the more we run, um, so the more we run a diverse set of candidates, we bring diverse perspectives, and a broader set of voters get motivated to actually believe their vote might count. Um, and then finally, I think we just we have a lot of work to do before 2020. I say this is a nonpartisan organization. Um, but I think in terms of getting more LGBT-friendly elected officials all the way up to the highest office, um, we have a lot of work to do. I invite you to look at an article, um, I won't use the time to do it now, in the Washington Post today that did a very detailed analysis of the voting that said, yes, Democrats have a lot of hope uh, based on the House election this year. It actually doesn't point to 2020. Um, and so I think we need to continue to build the, the number of people who are engaged who, for whatever reason, uh, chose to stay home still this election. Good evening. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with uh, colleagues that I love and admire and, um, and so many of you in the audience as well. Um, I think that the lesson from yesterday is that were it not for voter suppression and gerrymandering, we would have won many more seats uh, in state houses and in Congress. And I also think that um, that to double down on, on uh, Brett's point, I think it's not just uh, women that we should be proud of, it's black women in particular who are gonna save this country. And when you look at how black women voted versus white women, particularly white women married to men, uh, that is, that is, white women married to men are really our enemy. And so, uh, and those numbers were really bad in all of these districts where something was close, and yet it was, and it was the black women who really made the difference. I also think first time voters, it wasn't as big as we would have liked to have had, but this is what I think happened, and this is my optimism, and, and I understand I've been in conversations where it may be tempered, but my optimism is this. I think there are a lot of people who chose not to vote because they couldn't be disappointed again. They couldn't, they couldn't vote, they couldn't finally vote for the first time and then have things not go their way. I mean, there is, you know, we do have, especially, with, I was talking especially about young people, a sort of gratification, and if that doesn't happen, sort of distancing yourself from whatever it was that you feel wounded by. And I do feel like the fact that we sort of moved the needle, that people saw things change, that voting did actually matter, is going to make a big difference in two years if we do the work to continue to keep people engaged. So I think it's really going to be important to say, yeah, we move the needle a little bit, but voting matters, voting matters. And, and for the first time in, in actually my life as an adult that I recall in 2016 kicked this off, there is, I think, a burgeoning understanding in, from kids who did not even have any civics classes that exercising your right to vote is one of the most important things you can do as a citizen. Well, thank you all for, for, those, for, for those, those thoughts um, about an incredibly complicated and up and down subject. And I appreciate hearing the, all the way from optimism to, to you know, some of the worries that we all live with so intensely um, all our lives and especially in the last couple of years. So I want to shift just slightly and, and, and continue with you, Kate. 
uh, and, and, and look to another branch of the government that we haven't talked about yet, but inevitably is part of, the, uh, of what we're thinking about and looking at. And of course, I'm talking about the judiciary. Uh, and we have just been through a, I'm not sure what the right adjective is, but nightmarish would be one for it, uh, confirmation process that has put uh, Brett Kavanaugh onto the court. Uh, that has, of course, dramatic implications. We can all say a silent, or if you wish, a loud prayer for, for Ruth Bader Ginsburg at this time. Um, and hopefully she is, she is okay um, as a human being and as a justice. Um, but could you talk a little bit, Kate, about what it is that the addition of Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court means in terms of the movement's litigation strategies? So Maria, right there with you right now. Um, well, this is a dangerous moment. It is the first moment that I, as an attorney, uh, feel like the Supreme Court has been so thoroughly degraded that not only is it not hospitable to issues of fairness and justice and to say nothing of LGBT issues, um, but that it is dishonored. And when you have the court, which used to be for people who weren't lawyers or who didn't steep themselves in the law, you sort of had this, uh, this reverence, this sort of distance. It felt like something, they did something. It seemed to be important. We don't really know what it is, but these are amazing people. And now, it's like, okay, these are frat boys, some of them. Some of them seem to be okay, but this seems like every bit as corrupt and venal, as unseemly as any other branch of government in terms of what we've seen in the last two years. That is dangerous for democracy. It is dangerous for a constitutional democracy that requires three branches of government, and the court's supposed to be a checks and balance. You know, we've already kind of lost a little bit of that civics lesson. So I'm, I'm very worried about what it means for all sorts of cases going to the Supreme Court. To your point, Roger, we've already changed our strategy. We are slowing down federal litigation. We are looking to states in, to bring litigation instead of federal litigation. If we bring federal litigation, we are including state claims so we can keep it in state court if we need to. We are looking to bring cases in circuits, good circuits where we could win, and then if the opposing party wants to settle or wants to appeal, see if we can come to a settlement. So the strategy is now much more complex than it was previously. I, mean, I became a lawyer because I believed courts vindicated individual rights. And this was the Warren Court. I mean, this was like not a, you know, a super, super liberal court, but even the Rehnquist Court, some of you will remember. I mean, very conservative justice, but still understood that the courts played a role in defending the most vulnerable. And now we have a chief justice um, and sitting alongside him, at least three other justices who believe the court should play no role in vindica vindicating individual rights and actually for the court to be asked to is preposterous and a waste of their time. So we're in for a long hard slog. And the last thing I'll say on it, because I know you're about to say something, uh, is that, is that this, is, this happened as the result of a patient and measured strategy by Mitch McConnell and other Republicans. And if I could say anything to my super liberal and progressive and radical friends, of which I count myself as one, we can no longer have the attention span of a fruit fly if we actually want to see real change made. We have to have a 30-year plan like Mitch McConnell had with the judiciary, and we have to stick to it. That is how you actually remake change that will, is going to last for generations. So we, we have to rethink what winning means, short term and long term. Chris, as, as the, the, the other person with a legal organization here, if you wanted to add anything to what Kate just said, I just wanted to pose that at you. This does not count as your question, but, no, no. but I, but Kate, Kate come in. It's good. <laughs> All right, okay, very good. Uh, so, Ray, uh, in, uh, actually, no, Chris, I was going to turn to you next. Uh, the Trump administration, as we all know, has been in full attack mode for a while and is redoubling their efforts in attack mode around transgender rights. Now, given what happened in Massachusetts and some other developments around the country, you know, it, it's not all a gloomy picture. Um, and some of that activity, including Massachusetts, is happening on a state level. And so if you could just talk a little bit about some of the developments on a state level and how TLC as a national organization and looking at the landscape across the 50 states, how you are seeing things 
at the state level and where you see some opportunities and where you see some particular dangers? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. So, so I will start by just backing up a little, um, which is to say that, you know, the reality is that for transgender people, as far as having rights and protections on the books, it's, it's relatively recent, right? Like we're, we're talking the last like two decades or so. Um, and that, you know, we've seen this kind of increase in visibility for a community that also, you know, is super recent. We're talking the last decade, like last five years. So I, I just think that's important to ground it because while, while that is true, it is also true that the majority of, of trans people in the, this country, even while we've had those wins, have continued to struggle to survive on a daily basis, right? Facing intense discrimination, harassment, and violence. And so, and this is, this is pre-Trump, right? We're talking pre-Trump. So, and even before Trump came into the office, we were facing this climate of anti-trans legislation in the form of these bathroom bills across the country. And so then Trump gets elected. And, and I just think, I'll, and I'll get to the state and local, but I just think it's important to ground in, in what the, the overall reality is for trans and gender non-conforming people in this moment, in that ever since he came into office, um, he has taken action after action. And the, the draft memo that was leaked just a week or so ago is just, just one attack among so many that are really about attempting to eliminate the very existence of transgender people in this country to deny our very humanity and to deny our rights and that this is for a community that already was struggling to survive, already is struggling to survive, right? Every year over the last couple of years have been the most reported of trans murders of transgender people in this country, of which the majority are black trans women. So I just think it's important to ground in that this moment is devastating and for trans people, particularly black and brown trans people, uh, black and brown trans women, it's for a community that already was struggling to survive and facing such intense harassment and violence. And we've seen the ways in which this new administration has emboldened hate, right? Has emboldened discrimination and intolerance. And we've seen, and this is getting to the local and state, we've seen the impacts that that has had on the day-to-day -day, uh, ability of trans people to just live our lives in states and communities all across the country. We've heard story after story of increases in hate violence and discrimination, discrimination against transgender people. Um, so, you know, looking to, to the state and local level, um, so, so thank God, Massachusetts, that we won, because uh, if we hadn't, it, we would have for sure seen ballot initiatives all across the country. Uh, we are still very concerned that we will still continue to see anti-trans uh, legislation in states uh, across the country. Um, you know, though on the positive side, we've seen major wins in terms of being able to pass policies and laws, uh, recognizing the identities of non-binary people. Uh, we've seen that in, in state after state um, in the recent period. So we've also seen ways in which we've been able to advance and win. But I, I will just say that the, the overall picture, um, you know, and, and I know that there will be space in this conversation to talk about the ways in which there's real hope um, and the ways in which our communities have been incredibly powerful and res resilient in this moment. But, um, you know, the, the real picture for trans people, uh, for the majority of my community in this moment in this country is, is very, very bleak. People are very frightened um, and, you know, while we will absolutely do everything we can and we will fight in the courts and we will fight in the legislature, I just think it's important for us um, here in this room as an LGBT community, as an LGBT community in California to really hold um, the ways in which uh, trans folks, particularly um, you know, in states and regions across the country that have much less than we have here, um, are really, really struggling in this moment and are needing all the support um, from all of us that we can get. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So, Ray, uh, I know that over many, many years, it's been necessary in the DC universe, other places too, but in DC in particular, to fight defensive actions, as well as to try to move progressive uh, things ahead. And in the last couple of years, it's probably been, never been quite like the last couple of years in terms of just how necessary and how ubiquitous the, the needs are to do that. I know the task force has been deeply involved in that work for, for many years, but especially over the last couple of years. 
And could you just talk for a, a couple of minutes about the, what it is, what a couple of the highlights, if you will, that you have seen um, over the past couple of years in that work, and we're now looking into the next period, in the next couple of years, where you see some of that work most importantly focused. Thanks, Roger. So, uh, to kind of give this context, one of the things that many of our organizations, particularly the national uh, advocacy organizations and legal organizations, have been doing really for a decade prior to this, uh, this administration is examining the many, many, many places where we do or don't show up as a community in the federal government. So, you know, what captures the headline is big fancy legislation or, you know, people getting elected, but, the, but, but really there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places within federal agencies where we could be getting more money, we could be getting more programs. So um, the task force, along with a, a whole coalition of organizations, um, actually a, a, uh, it was a, a program dreamed up by Matt Foreman, who's here tonight, um, before Obama was elected, surveyed the entire federal government for policies that should be changed. We wrote how the policy should be changed. We often found the person, the role, who should change it. We created a literal binder, and because it was way back when, a CD-ROM <laughs> of all of those policies, and gave it to the Obama administration, and spent eight years working with them to change hundreds and hundreds of policies that didn't require any congressional action. It was beneficial because it improved a lot of people's lives and it got a lot more money flowing to our community. The risk of it we're seeing now, which is that you can undo those policies. So though many of those policies are being undone. They range from things like, if you go to apply for a passport for your child, it no longer says mother or father on that, on that application or in many federal applications, um, to non-discrimination in public housing. Right, large and small effects. So our job now is to defend that progress and fight back whenever the administration, we, have, we find out about it, whenever the administration tries to make changes that will be detrimental to our community. And, and Chris mentioned one, which I'll talk a little bit more about at some point, um, which was the leaking of this memo that they would change their definition of gender. Um, so right now what we're doing uh, with organizations in DC across not only in the LGBTQ movement but across movements is we're pushing back when we find out about these changes and sometimes we win. We found out, for example, that even after a whole process um, that led to the, the Census Bureau putting a question on one of their surveys, they do many surveys, excuse me, they, we literally found out in the dead of night, one of our staff members got a call very, very early in the morning saying, the question about sexual orientation was on last night, and it's off this morning. Find out what's going on. We did that because we have career public servants who care deeply about our community, who are doing the best they can to identify when threats are coming our way. And we're supporting those, those uh, folks in the government who are able to do that. Secondly, so when we can win, we can win. We pushed back on that. We, got a, we did uh, a lot of letters. We did a lot of comments. We pushed back. We did a lot of media strategy. The question came back on the survey. So would we have counted that as a big win in the previous eight years? Maybe not. But it's a huge win for us now. Because they have that question, it allows us to continue to push to have our lives as LGBTQ people represented on all of the census surveys moving forward. It's going to take a lot of work to get there and we're not going to get it right away, but pushing back and winning sometimes matters, even on small things. Second is to lessen the damage. So a number of things have happened over the last two years. We found out about them, we mobilized people, and the administration backed off a little bit. Still not great in a number of circumstances, but they did back off. The third strategy that we're employing is to slow things down. Kate talked about slowing down legal cases. We're doing the exact same thing. We are gumming up the wheels. We are slowing down the process. We are flooding them 
with comments, which are required any time they change a rule or a policy. And it is slowing some things down, and it buys us time to build a voice against a change or look at other strategies where we can bolster a need for our community. Finally, I think, um, you know, these, these are not small matters. And in fact, just over the last two years, we have found 900 opportunities. We call them opportunities. <laughs> 900, 900 opportunities for our community to push back on these changes. Some we've won, some we've slowed down, some we've lost. But 900 in two years. The way that we're able to do that is that we created a coalition uh, called FedWatch. It is over 175 organizations, and they're not just LGBTQ organizations, but it is primarily focused on look, literally reading through the Federal Register. So others of us don't have to. <laughs> we have people reading through the Federal Register every single day, finding out what the changes are, large or small, coming together to create strategies to push back, and sending out action alerts. So sometimes you all will get uh, emails from any number of our organizations saying, this is happening, it's the comment period, please tell your story or, so, or a story of someone you know. If I were to ask you to do one of a handful of things that actually make a difference, please respond to those alerts, tell your story, tell someone else's story, flood them with stories because they have to look at them and they have to respond to them and it slows the process down. And in some cases, it allows us to win, to not make a change. Um, I, expect, I, I do want to note the next time you might be seeing one of those is around the changing of the definition of gender um, that was leaked. It's called the HHS memo, but it's much broader than that. Um, it affects Department of Justice, Department of Education, um, Health and Human Services, and possibly others. We haven't been able to get our hands on the memo yet, but we will. When you see that, it is absolutely critical that you share that with people you know and we push back on this. We've already seen with the, the wave of coming together over the last couple of weeks around this, that, and we've already heard from inside the administration that they're getting more nervous about doing this. So it does work as nerdy as it is, it works. Thank you. Thank you. Of those 170 organizations, about how many are explicitly LGBTQ? Um, probably about 80 or 90. I mean, it's really, it's a cross movement. It's civil rights organizations, women's organizations, um, uh, uh, all sorts of so social justice organizations. So it's a massive, massive coalition showing up, originally starting for LGBTQ issues, but making the connections between all of our lives. That's especially exciting to about that. Um, Brett, going back, going, going back, going back to you. Um, PRC works chiefly with, with folks affected by HIV. And that remains a huge uh, issue in our community, especially uh, among, but not exclusively, but especially among gay and, and bi men, and especially gay and bi men or MSM of color. Uh, there's also a major initiative that's going on, which I know you've been very deeply involved in uh, on a regional level as well as nationally, which goes under the label of getting to zero. Could you just talk a little bit about, about where that stands regionally and nationally and what you see right now as some of the principal challenges or, or focus areas in that initiative and more importantly, of course, in actually getting us to zero? God, you asked some difficult questions. <laughs> oh, you can talk about this in your sleep, I know. <laughs> I want to start out with something that is that is personal. It's something that that I uh, have been struggling with, certainly for the for uh, in different times in my life, more and le or less. But really, in the last couple of years, and this is uh, I'm going to tell quickly my personal story. I'm a, I'm a kid of the '60s, born in '64. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to a Jewish mother and a black father. Um, so there is a story in and of itself, and we can talk about that one later. But I got the opportunity to be loved, kissed, hugged, supported by a black face and a white face. And so I found value in both of them. The love superseded all of that. I, I, I bring that to this conversation because now I feel like we're at this kind of cultural precipice. 
uh, a couple stats that I'll throw out. A little over uh, a million people in the United States living with HIV. Uh, the African American population around 12%. And yet we make up 39% of the HIV cases. Uh, here in lovely San Francisco, political, <coughs> progressive, uh, leaning left, really about the causes, uh, informed, participatory. Um, we have about 16,000 people living with HIV, vast majority of them people of color. 4% of the population makes up uh, African Americans here in San Francisco. We also make up 36% of the homeless population. You see where I'm going with all of these, these disparities. In a black African American report that just came out around asthma, HIV, high blood pressure, birth deaths, uh, lowest life expectancy, <coughs> lowest income, household income, we came in dead last. Oh, let me throw in low uh, high school graduation rates. African Americans, and I think to myself, San Francisco, 840,000 people, seven by seven square mile, an $11.2 billion budget, with um, uh, ways in which we're either deciding between light blue, medium blue, and dark blue, not really red to get in our way. How do we have this? And I kept, Wanting, and I, my question continues to, to reveal itself to me, and I'm worried. I'm worried that like George Orwell's Animal Farm, with the, the animals set out to do something different, right, than the humans, and all of a sudden, they recreated exactly what they were running from. So what are the drivers that have us doing this in our sub-community? And that's what I'm struggling with. And, and so when I'm talking about, and we're thinking about getting to zero, which is uh, zero deaths, zero new infections, zero stigma, uh, and zero, vi zero viral load. Uh, when we're talking about this big effort, it's about education, it's about expanded services, it's about prep, it's about early treatment, it's about uh, making sure that people retain themselves into treatment and, and in care. We've done a great job until we get to the, it's like the L, the G, and the B, and then the T. And that's like the African American community. So where I'm struggling with this significant effort in San Francisco and nationally is I need for everyone to make sure that they make it a part of their conversation. It needs the political will and the community will that it had when it was a significant crisis and people were dying from it. And now that we've kind of stabilized so much of the population, which, which uh, we need to have an honest conversation here, in the Caucasian community, it's stabilized. But when we start talking about the fringes of African Americans and Latinos and Asians and people of color, we somehow pivoted and we, and we left it and so moved on to something else because good was just good. Good was good enough. And good can't be good enough. You have to find a way of knowing that if your brother or your sister is still struggling, if viral loads are still high in Baby Hunter's Point, in Viz Valley, that those are your brothers and sisters and you still need to participate, be educated, have that conversation, advocate for them, write those checks. So this is my like call to action for everybody who is here. And I know in so many ways I'm preaching to the choir because you're, you're already there. I just encourage us to make sure that we're having these conversations as often as we can at the dinner table, uh, at the lunch table at work, so that folks get an understanding that it isn't over for HIV. Uh, it may be over for you, or it may be over for your circle of friends. You may have achieved all that you needed to do in stabilizing your life and moving it forward. But just know that for every one of you, there's somebody else who's struggling. And it's that lower rust belt, I mean the lower southern uh, belt that is struggling deeply right now uh, around HIV and, and women of color, particularly trans women of color. And, and so that's my encouragement to everybody to continue to have these conversations. But we're doing great work. San Francisco has always led the way uh, in terms of creating a model of care that was inclusive or often what we're now talking about is whole person care. You were saying earlier that PRC predominantly serves HIV positive individuals. We, did, we went through a double merger and now uh, we serve basically half of people of our clients are HIV positive. Others are suffering from mental health issues and substance use issues. The same client that walked in a couple years ago just for HIV now is dealing with an opioid issue and through Baker Places we serve them through our mental health and substance use issues. Many of our clients are struggling with PTSD or, or depression and we're serving that client too. So the, the evolution of the disease has revealed itself and been around long enough that we're dealing with aging issues, 
we're dealing with mental health issues, and we're dealing with substance use issues, and how can we find a way of talking about it in an integrated way so that it's not siloed funding that leads to siloed services, that leads to siloed thoughts and processes where we say, that's them, or what, what, what I call the other. We can't other it because that is us. It is all about us. So those are, those are a few of my thoughts around that. I know that as we continue to talk more about it, I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit more about what we're doing at, at PRC and the Department of Public Health. But uh, I, I needed to get that out because I'm watching this happen, and I have to figure out how this very well-intended group of people called the LGBTQI movement is, is quietly and possibly benignly uh, following the path of what we were running from for so much and, and for so long. Thank you for sharing all of that from, from beginning to end. Uh, and and I, I'm going to want to circle back to some of that in a moment, but, but I also want to get to Maria. Uh, and so, uh, Maria, thank you for, for, for coming here and, and being with us and outright, of course, looks at the globe looks at the world and the worldwide movement for LGBTQ uh, <coughs> people. So on the global stage right now, we've been seeing everything from an incredible, wonderful event in India with the striking down of the infamous Article 377, uh, which has, maybe we can talk about for just a second, but I'm not sure everybody will know what that is. So wonderful historic things happening like that that affect more than a billion people directly to deepening repression from Indonesia to Tanzania to a great deal of reason to be worried about what's, what's happening and going to happen in Brazil and literally all around the globe. So at the risk of asking a completely simplistic question, but mostly one I'm just giving you an open field on this, are we going backward, are we going forward, is it all at once? How do, how do you and an outright see kind of the state, the, the state of things on a global <laughs> stage right now? I mean, I think we, I think, for the foreseeable future and probably beyond, the answer to that question is going to be both. We're making enormous progress in a place like India. So the 377 was basically the British Empire criminalizing same-sex relations all over the world. But the model law was the India 37, Section 377. And so it was struck down in September uh, of this year in what will historians will debate whether it was like the decision of the decade or the century. It impacts, of course, everyone in India, currently 1.3 billion people, and you know, regardless of what percentage you want to claim are gay, you know, it's a lot of people. It's also going to impact a lot of other countries. In the same way that India had the model law that but then, I mean, even in Singapore, the, the law is 377A. They didn't even come up with their own number. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's going to impact Singapore, Sri Lanka, Kenya, around the world. The striking down of this law in India is going to have ripple effects. And so that's, a, I mean, that's an enormous step forward. At the same time, we of course, who, I, I'm personally from Sweden, Sweden decriminalized same-sex relations in 1944, the same year my mother was born. And of course, it didn't go from being criminal to being perfectly respectable. It went from being criminal to just being sick and immoral. And so, of course, even in India, as you know, people are celebrating this huge win, there is still there's still a lot of fight that needs to happen. And just as an aside, I mean, the, the decision in India, and as, as many of my colleagues on this panel have said, like, you don't get to a win. It's not a short term. It's not a race, like a, you know, 100 meter race. Like, a win like that takes decades of organizing. So, and I mean, I think that that perspective on any international work is necessary. You need to know that you're in it for the long haul. That's the only way that change can happen. We were super excited at Outright when we saw in the 490 plus page verdict that actually a piece of text that we wrote and submitted to one of the UN agencies 
made its way into the verdict. Like they really took information and legal judgments from around the world and from around a lot of different institutions and put into that verdict. So all of this sort of the, this global movement or our global movements fighting, it really does matter. At the same time, we see a huge backlash. Our communities are visible everywhere. People are out there, they're organizing. Increasingly, I think governments are less concerned about what we do in our so-called bedrooms. They're not as concerned about that anymore. This is why we see like the case of Russia, I'm sure many of you have heard of the anti-propaganda law. Like they basically, they don't care if you have sex as long as no one knows about it. It's worse to wear a rainbow sticker on your jacket than actually to have same-sex relations. As long as you're in private, you know, it doesn't really matter. But if you try to spread it by showing up with a rainbow sticker, you know, horrible, uh, then they're going to clamp down. And so this increased visibility, this backlash, results in violence. I mean, this week we've been very concerned with Tanzania because the regional commissioner of Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, yeah. decided to uh, form a task force to root out the homosexuals mm -hmm. of Dar es Salaam and the rest of Tanzania. There's a lot of organizing behind the scenes, a lot of uh, UN agencies and, and, and other countries in private trying to put some pressure on Tanzania. So actually the national government, not that they are in any way LGBTIQ friendly, but they actually over the weekend distanced themselves from the regional commissioner and said that that was his personal initiative. So it sort of, we sort of uh, relaxed a little bit and who knows, it's not, it's certainly not, the crisis certainly isn't over. Many of our friends have actually uh, relocated to other places. Some, you know, decided they needed to get out of the country. Uh, but this backlash is real and it's happening in more countries than I can mention. And I think I'll stop there for now. So I want to shift now to to pose kind of questions, uh, one or two questions, depending on kind of how we go with time, because so we are going to reserve at least 30 minutes for, for the for the Q and A. Um, and, and where I wanted to start picks up a little bit off of what what uh, Ray you were talking about as an example about a coalition uh, of 170 different organizations, and a little bit also Brett off of, of kind of what, what you were talking about, and. We hear frequently about how important it is for our organizations and our movement to be working in collaboration with and to, to work in an intersectional way and to work with you know, immigrant movements, with community of color movements, with women's movements, with, with uh, labor, with, with all kinds of others. And as is everything else, it's undoubtedly, you know, it, is a, it is a mixed bag. I mean, they one can point to areas where, where we're, you know, we're doing great, where we're doing poorly. Um, and I would like to ask you know, each of you to share you know, whatever thoughts you might have about well, where are some of the places that we're doing that really, really well? And where is it that we really need to pay attention where we're, we're falling particularly short? And you can take that, you know, again, you can talk about it nationally, or you can talk about it on a regional level, you know, as you see fit, because all of those apply to, to, to our lives. So whoever wishes to begin. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. I think, um, well, I always find it interesting when, um, when there's a critique of um, being involved in, an, in a broad range of issues uh, as an organization and getting pushback that says, why are you doing that? That's not an LGBTQ issue. Mm -hmm. And my reaction is always like, based on what evidence? Because LGBTQ people are everywhere. We are in every demographic. I mean, it is in some ways, it is our secret power. And it is also a sort of unicorn-like existence that we occupy. We are in every demographic. Every issue that impacts any human being impacts queer people and LGBT people. Uh, we are in every strata of social life in every country. And, and so to not treat it, any issue that degrades or stigmatizes or undermines the humanity of humans <laughs> means LGBT people are impacted by that. And an issue where I feel like we've been doing 
uh, better, and in some cases well, is around immigration. Um, NCLR, we launched our immigration project years and years ago, really focused on asylum, uh, representing LGBTQ asylees who are seeking asylum in this country based on horrific persecution in their home countries. And we've represented asylees from all over the world. That helped us, developing that expertise helped us build relationships with mainstream immigration rights organizations um, and figures and individuals and policymakers. And so when Trump started clamping down, and when it's just his rhetoric, even before this election, was about stigmatizing and demonizing immigrants, many of us came together to share messaging, to share strategies, uh, and to really unite forces and say, oh no, we are not gonna let this happen. And of course, look, it's hard when every apparatus of the government is arrayed against you to make a dent in that, but it makes a difference to the people on the ground who are being targeted by this administration to feel like you speak up for them. And, and to what Chris was talking about with this memo, this floating, this, this tweet that we're gonna have sex assigned at birth is the only way to determine someone's gender. That was an all hands on deck moment. Not just in the LGBTQ community, but in every strata of people who cared about the basic humanity of our brothers and sisters. And I think that is what threw them off their game a little bit. They really thought they could get away with that. And, 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 when, he, and when he attacks immigrants, he, he's, th he's thinking he can get away with it. And the only way we've been able to push them off, not stop them entirely, and I understand people are still terrorized, and I know this is a horrible moment for many people to live in, but we, by coming together across issues, we really have stood in the breach. And we have prevented him in many ways from doing his worst. It's still, I don't anyway want to, want to discount how horrific it is for so many people who do not have the privilege of being in this room and who have to worry about ICE coming and knocking on their door or not knocking on their door, just bulldozing into their house and taking away a loved one. But by coming together and showing force we really have been able to have our reach exceed our grasp and push back against some of the worst that this administration plans. And I think for us anyway, in the work we do on immigration, I feel like that's where we've seen some real, um, if not headway, <laughs> at least maybe uh, having some bulwark against uh, the worst that he has planned. That's a great example, thank you. Yeah. And if, if I could just jump in on that cause, and tell two stories along the same line. So, um, this was in the first first year of Trump. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we got word that there was a small caravan of trans immigrants that were approaching the border, about 17 folks. Um, and so what we were able to do um, is send our attorneys and our organizers to the border, along with another uh, national um, immigration law uh, center. Um, we were able to partner with grassroots, community-based organizations on both sides of the border. We partnered with churches on both sides of the border. Um, so that when that group of 17 trans folks crossed the border, they crossed with a 500-page legal brief, with rallies on both sides of the border cheering them on, and with churches ready to receive them um, on the U.S. side. So. It's a, it's a small story, in, in, and we were able to get them all out. We were able to get them all, all the trans women out of detention, which is huge. And so it's a small story, and it took a huge lift. But to me, it speaks to the importance of working cross sectors with churches, with grassroots organizations, with legal organizations, and the trans immigrants, the trans women themselves, who knew that if they crossed together, that there was more power and safety in crossing them as, as a group than individually. Um, the, the other story that I'll share is, is similar. Um, so, you know, also the, the conditions at the borders have gotten much, much worse. And so, you know, what we did with those 17 folks, I don't know if it would be possible now, honestly. Um, so, you know, earlier this, this year, there was a large caravan, and we, there's now a, a much larger caravan approaching the border, and I'm sure folks have heard about it. Um, but earlier this year, there was another one, and we knew that there was a group of uh, trans folks who were part of that. And so, so, so they were able to cross. Um, unfortunately, one of the women who crossed as part of it, Roxana Hernandez, she died um, in ICE detention. 
um, after being there for, for not very long. Um, and so, so when that happened, it was a moment of uh, mobilization, particularly amongst the trans movement, particularly amongst um, LGBT immigration groups. And so what came out of that, that horrible story, and we are still fighting for justice for her, is that there was a convening of 100 black and brown LGBT immigrant rights leaders from all across the country who came together in Albuquerque, New Mexico just a couple months ago. A convening like that had, had literally not happened before. Um, and they came together to call for justice for Roxana. They came together to also call for um, the release of Udoka, a gay Nigerian man um, who had been held in detention and who was recently freed. And to me, this spoke to just one, the, the ways in which trans folks and LGBT immigrants of color, uh, one, were able to uh, hold leadership in such a powerful way, and it was cross-race, and it was cross-gender, and it was cross-sexuality, and it was from folks all across the country, and it really, it was led by Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement, which is a, a Latinx group, uh, Transgender Law Center, and the Black LGBT Migrant Project. So it also was this moment where it really centered the communities who are most targeted and most vulnerable in this moment. We saw the convening being led by and centering Black, trans, and gay migrants in a way that had, had not been seen before. So there's also ways in which in this moment of, of real attack, that we are continuing to build cross community, cross movement in ways that, you know, honestly have not, not been seen before. I want to um, speak also to the second part of your question here in a sec. I, I, I will say it, the relationships are deep. They're not superficial between our movement and other movement leaders. Sunday, two Sundays ago, it seems like months ago, two Sundays ago, when we got word about this leaked memo because of the New York Times article around gender, Immediately, immediately, I and other leaders in LGBT organizations started getting texts, emails, and phone calls from non-LGBT leaders of other organizations in other movements saying, where do we show up? Tell us where we need to be. And in fact, one of the women who, I, I don't think she slept for weeks, Fatima Goss Graves, who runs National Women's Law Center, must have been exhausted. And she showed up Monday morning at a press conference with us and spoke. And we're doing the same on issues that most people don't say are LGBT issues, but they are. Um, to the second part of your question, it's kind of where can we where can we work this better, right? I would say that the next um, phase of, of really where we need to be intentional about this is when we work on local and state ballot measures and legislation. And I'll give you an example. Um, a couple years ago in Houston, there was a repeal of a human rights ordinance. It got framed as a trans bathroom issue. That ordinance was a civil rights ordinance. It was race, gender, sex, on and on. Same thing with North Carolina. That wasn't just about trans bathroom issues. That was about whether or not you can file a lawsuit if you've been, if you've experienced discrimination as a person of color who is not LGBTQ. That was whether or not a city or a town can pass a law that is any more favorable in civil rights than the state. So I think what we're looking at next is how do we make sure over a long period of time we are showing up, we are building relationships, and we're actually getting a jump start so that all of these all of these things that are coming up don't get framed as transgender people being the bad people that the state has to fear. These laws and these policies affect a broad range of people and we absolutely have to fight for uh, all of the issues in those laws that affect our community and lift those up too. But I do think that that's the next piece of our cross-movement work as we're looking at the next decade. Brad or Maria, did you want to yeah, I did, I, two areas that I think we um, uh, have done a good job in, 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 and one is really emerging, and that is around LGBT and seniors and just senior services. Mm -hmm. That somehow, you know, we all, for those of us who have a little bit of Peter Pan syndrome in us, never thought we were going to just get old, <laughs> deal with the old issues, turns out we are. 
And so there was a way uh, in which, with some great intentionality, because there was an inevitability to it, LGBTs had to start thinking about long-term planning and who's going to care for me uh, in my senior years and where are the services and the supports and the resources uh, that I need and that are available to me. And I've watched a beautiful uh, uh, grouping of conversations and, and services and resources coming together to serve the LGBT community, particularly with seniors. So I'm really encouraged by that, by that partnership. And then another one has always, um, it, it has ebbed and flowed uh, over the years. And periodically, Ray and uh, Kate and Chris, and I know we, I'll, I will be getting together with you soon, Maria, have had this intention, deep intention, and yet sometimes a struggle with finding ways of making sure that advocacy and policy organizations are informed by direct service organizations, and direct service organizations are informed by uh, policy and advocacy. Because at the end of the day, your quality of life, the quality of life that we have right now, is based on what are, is on the books, whether that's health care or whatever that may happen to be. And so if you can hear in real time the conditions on the ground that are affecting the fullness of the LGBT community, that informs your work, often prioritizes it, because sometimes there are subsets that really need more attention paid to it. We've made an intention of having that conversation on a regular basis, and I think that that cross-sectionality and intersection is, has been working, and, and we have, are a better movement for it, because we have struggled with it in years past. I mean, I think from my global work, I have seen, I mean, it comes, it's obvious you have to work with other movements, and I think, I don't know, um, but maybe, maybe the U.S. has been lagging behind a little bit on this compared to movements, LGBTIQ movements in other countries. Uh, I mean, it's so obvious. We need the allies, and we need to be the allies. So I think that that's, for me, it's like a good example. I think is what we've seen. In, we do a lot of work at the United Nations, and of course, under this administration, it's been more challenging. Uh, <laughs> but I think what we have seen in the first, you know, in the first two years, in some instances, our access has been a little bit better than for some other organizations. Because maybe a little bit, the gay issue is not quite as threatening as women's rights, for example. Abortion is even more contentious than gay rights. So I think we have been able to access a little bit more information in some situations than some of our colleagues in the women's rights movement. And of course, we run right back to them and talk to them and strategize together. I mean, it's like, that is how we have to do this work. We have to show up and, you know, they have to show up. I mean, I think an area where I don't see as quite as much crossover is maybe with the climate justice movement. And for us, and for me personally, a wake-up call has been the work that we're doing with LGBTIQ activists from the Pacific Islands and, and some of the Caribbean islands. They're like, we have to look at these issues too. Our countries are going to cease to exist due to climate change. So I think that that for us is something that we can definitely learn more, we can show up more there. Uh, last question for, for all of you as a group, and then I want to turn to, 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 to all of you. Uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, we'll get to Q&A in just a moment. Uh, I wanted to just ask you, if we were to look down the pike five years, so I'm actually looking past 2020, you know, past 2019, past 2020, where do you see our movement in five years? If you were to look into your own crystal ball, where do you see everyone I'm going to jump in just because I, um, since we're making it all up and I feel the need to be optimistic, you know, there are bigger movements that are out there and they, they haven't come up by name and, I'm th and I wrote them down. I mean, we need to call it out. Black Lives Matter. Me Too movement matters, right? Never again with gun violence. And I feel that in so many ways our movement uh, the, the health, the strength, 
uh, the robust way in which we can move in the world is, is predicated on how well we do with partnering with these large, larger movements. And I, and I hope that we pay attention to that because if we don't, again, we will move our agenda forward, but we will move forward in a siloed way. And so we have to think more broadly about that. And that was to Kate's point earlier and to Ray's point of just really coalition building, the ways in which we have to build these coalitions. So I would say our greatest opportunity in front of us is finding ways of partnering with uh, these larger movements that have come online and in the view and the zeitgeist and focus uh, of our society. And just building on that, I mean, I really do not feel like we have fully plumbed how powerful it is that we literally are everywhere. It's not just a slogan. Yeah. And I just was listening earlier tonight to the, um, the Iranian American woman who won a house seat in, or won a, a state Senate seat in Florida. And she talked about how she knitted together the coalition that made that happen. And she's not a lesbian identified woman herself, but she included, my district includes the Pulse nightclub. So I needed to, I wanted to talk about issues of discrimination and justice and fairness for the LGBTQ community and then also gun violence and sensible gun laws. And so it's, I, do, I do think there is this way in which we, we in some ways, some of us in the LGBT community are the last ones to think about all issues being LGBTQ issues. And if we thought about all issues as LGBTQ issues, we could show up, we would show up in all these other movements. We are, the leadership of Black Lives Matter started with three women who are queer identified. So this is like, this is how, like I'm serious, black women will save us. I'm totally clear on that. But, but we, we, can, we actually have more power than we think by marginalizing ourselves as only LGBTQ and then there are only LGBTQ movements. So I would like to see us five years from now being led by individuals, queer and non-queer, who bring us in and we bring them in to unite and really step into our power. I think because I think you unite all of that and you know these fools that are in pushing the levers of power in government right now, they're gone. And so are the people who have, who have been ignited by them. They are marginal too. They should be the marginal ones. Not people of color, not poor people, not queer people. I mean, I think from the, if I look five years ahead globally, I mean, currently there are over 70 countries that criminalize same-sex relations. And I mean, that's, that's just such a basic uh, measure. And I think if we look five years ahead, we're going to be in the 60 somethings. Things are in enough places moving, well, maybe not moving, they're being pushed in the right direction. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. It's not something that's automatically moving. But our movements are pushing things in the right direction. And that, for me, is that's, that's what's going to happen. That's what I'm part of. That's, that, that is what we're fighting for, and it's going to happen. Uh, so that's part of it. It's going to, of course, generate more backlash, but we're going to fight that too. Um, so I'm going to start a little negative, but I will get more positive. Um, <laughs> so, you know, my first kind of response to that question and the first kind of what was in my heart is that uh, more of my community will have been lost. Um, and, I, and I just think that's real and it's true and it has, it has always been true and it is going to be more so in this moment and over the next few years. Um, and, you know, depending on what we do, depending on what we do as a community and a movement, I also could see that along with the, that loss, that in five years we will have trans organizations all across the country, which we do now, but that they will be strong, they will be resourced, they will be connected to each other, and that they will continue to do everything they can to keep our folks safe and alive, and that in doing so, they will have built up community, they will have built up infrastructure, they will have built up allies, and that we will actually be in a stronger place alongside the loss. Um, I'll just add briefly, I'm, I am a 
glass half full gal um, most of the time. And I, I would also reflect that had you asked us that question five years ago, uh, we probably would have been saying very different things than are the reality now. So um, I don't like to predict that much. I, I will say a lot of it depends, right? Um, and no matter what happens, um, we're going to be cleaning up a lot. The, the sheer magnitude of what is happening now to build a government, government and reshape a country in a Christian worldview, in a nationalist worldview, in a white supremacist worldview, will have a lot of casualties. Um, and, and I'm seeing the, the um, wear and tear on a lot of members of our community now with uh, regular existential threats. So the, the part of me that, that knows how resilient we are as a community knows that part of our work to do between now and five years from now and after that is to sustain each other and figure out um, how to pace ourselves. And someone recently who used to run a gay men's chorus told me about the concept of, um, I think he called it interval breathing, where part of the choir sings while the other part is breathing and then they come back in. But as an audience member, you hear one tone. And I feel like we're entering, we have to enter this time of kind of interval breathing of like, not everyone can show up all the time every day. We cannot expect that of each other. But that we can create partnerships both on an individual level, but really on a kind of a systemic level, so that five years from now there are enough of us who still have the energy to keep fighting. Because we've built where we got to now, and even though a lot of it is being taken apart brick by brick, we've got the blueprints. So we're gonna rebuild it. I have no doubt we will rebuild it. I hope that that work gets to start a few years earlier than five years from now. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to open it up to, uh, to people who have questions. I will do my best to, to keep track of folks. Um, so um, please, yes, go ahead. Um, thank you for being here. I've been uh, rescued by some of you, and that's how I am here. Um, <clears throat> You know, I heard Brett Kavanaugh and some of these people in law school were kind of groomed into a direction. So this is what I vision, maybe 30 years from today, that we will groom into law schools and we'll have a black female trans Supreme Court judge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so my question is this, how are we going to help our students get there? Okay, they're in SROs. So how are we going to help them finish what they need to finish? That means that we have to stick together. I was at Standing Rock speaking of crossroads and sticking together. The whole world was there up against the black snake. I saw it, and I think it could happen. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to um, invite any? Well, I'll just say, uh, the, this is, Kavanaugh came out of, to your point, a very intentional system uh, that has been invested in by the right. The Heritage Foundation has existed for a very long time, and they realized 20 years ago that the way they were going to remake the judiciary is by grooming law students. And so they took law interns from colleges and law schools all over the country and put them up for free in apartments that were built in DC and then deployed them in branches of the government where they could take hold. This, that's the strategy. We really need to, and then you go back even earlier. I mean, when you're talking, you know, access to education. These were privileged kids. There's no doubt about that. So early investments. I feel like if you could, if we could actually give every parent who's struggling 
to uh, raise their kids and read to them and provide time to them. If we could give them each $40,000 a year just so they could focus on being the kind of parent that every kid deserves and the kind of parent they want to be but they can't because they're working four jobs, that would change everything. And then you build an infrastructure to get them well educated and to put them up and to put them in internships and to house them for free and we deploy them to have a world view about what kind of country we want to live in and is founded in justice and security and safety and free from stigma and all of that. But it's really about starting early and really making a commitment that this is generational. So, uh, other questions? And I want to maybe take, take, take two or three questions uh, at a time and then, and then put them to the, the, the panel. So please. Um, <clears throat> Sean, I, I can run up there. Um, I'm really frustrated by the increasingly dis, uh, disappearing Democratic coalition. More and more voters are identifying as independent. Unions are shrinking. <clears throat> We're not really seeing a growth of the Democratic and left kind of political establishment. On the same thought, um, the Democrats and political parties don't really build anything permanent. They build toward a campaign. They do, they're like little rapid startups that arrive at election day, then they shut down and go back to their corners. So the political infrastructure isn't really building anything permanent movements do, organizations do. So there is no strategy. There's barely a message from the Democrats to have an urban strategy, a suburban strategy, a rural strategy, a western strategy. Like the right had a southern strategy, right? So why the left hasn't been able to create a long-term vision for how we pick up all of these western states or all of these suburban districts Evangelical voters seem to be the single largest voting bloc on the right. And eight out of the ten things that they care about the most are things that many people in this room could get behind, right? About, you know, things that Christians are supposed to care about. There's a way to fracture them. There's a way to invite them. There's a way to build a coalition with them. Why is there no strategy coming from any coalition on the left for that kind of thing, to bring those voters to the left? It's not going to come from the Democrats. So do we as a movement, or in any of the circles you all sit in nationally, see anything emerging to fracture that coalition and bring them to our side, is it's not gonna happen from the Democrats. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Um. Hello? Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question that I had was a little bit about contesting power. So I'm a little nervous also that it seems like a lot of the folks that we depend on, especially in the US, um, are on the Democratic side or on the left side. So when we, and increasingly like the hyper partisanship, like, and kind of tribal politics in some of these areas. I'm originally from Georgia, so it's, um, yet now it's really encouraging to see that it's becoming a battleground state and that folks are mobilizing. Um, but it's just really um, innervating to see that like, when we don't have um, our people who are amenable to our community um, in positions of leadership in an elected office, um, we are really, uh, pardon the French, fucked over, right? Like we are in serious like crisis mode. Um, and one of the things that I was gonna just like question about that is also how do we dismantle um, like structural sources of power, um, especially like misinformation campaigns and how there's like on the right this conservative um, misinformation ecosystem that's basically a privatized propaganda like um, machine. And so like now we're fighting with people and we don't even have a common set of facts to be able to have a conversation and move people forward. Like politics has gotten to such a uh, outrageous like point and where things are just like misinformation campaigns and like things like this so I, I find that to be a very difficult uh, place to be organizing in uh, especially when you're trying to have conversations with people and move them forward in a logical way they're just so um, plugged into like these kind of like what their their political tribe is and how do we move past that and how do we deconstruct some of these um, sources of power Right, that the right has, like for example, Fox News and some of these other things. Two really yeah, glad, glad everybody's yeah. thinking like you know very very small, thinking big. Um, uh, one more question, maybe to throw out the next one. Turn over. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Dimitri. Good. 
Let's see everybody. Um, one of the questions that I had was around religious freedom. It's a, it's a hot topic that actually hasn't come up once, um, so I'm really surprised about that. And uh, I view it as one of the top threats to our freedoms right now, um, particularly in things like adoption. I mean, I feel very lucky, lucky being a gay man living in San Francisco in California where I know I'm protected, but across our states, that is not the case. I was able to adopt with my husband, but those freedoms are threatened, and what are we doing about them? So, you know, I, I would love to hear about a strategy around how we can defend and get in front of those issues before we're really in defensive mode. Thank you. So I'm gonna take those, those three for the, for, for, for the, for the moment. Uh, and then I, I saw your hand, and we'll get back to, to you and others. Uh, so we had a question about frustration of the shrinking of democratic infrastructure and strategies for bringing kind of the other side over to us. And also another question that was uh, around how, how do we uh, attack and dismantle some of the structural sources of power that we see on the other side. Uh, and those kind of actually go, go together really well. And then maybe we can talk about the religious freedom question go a, a little bit separately. Well, it's all intermixed, but maybe a little separately. So on the first couple of questions, um, uh, anybody want to offer some, so, some thoughts about that? Big picture questions. Yes, Brad. Yeah, I, here, I, I wrote down Auntie Maxine Waters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, and, and I think we all are going to be in some way on a spectrum of how we need to uh, approach this particular issue of this hyper bipartisan or, um, um, uh, separatism that we have going on right now politically. But, but I, I'm a big believer of, I don't know that I'm gonna spend lots of my time to, trying to convince you. It's like going on a date and trying to convince somebody that you're the right, you're the right guy. If you, my mother said, don't go out looking for the right person, go out being the right person. And I feel like we have to figure out a way that, that our message is so appealing that we don't have to fight for folks to come over, that they would want to come over. So I believe that there is a, a, a lack of attention paid to a, a full strategy of why you would want to be a Democrat or why you would want to be uh, on this side rather than being on the right. So I'm, I'm not spending a whole lot of time. I'm like Maxine Waters with the half classes. Like, I don't have to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm a little bit of a hilltop seeker, so I'm headed there, and I'm just going to stay there, and I'm going to get across there. So, so for those of us who are diplomatic, I think that's great, and we're there, but we also need some warriors and some soldiers who are willing to fight the good fight in that regard. So I think that is a, a big issue for me, but I, I, I firmly believe that we have to ourselves develop the appealing components of why you would want to be uh, a part of either the Democratic Party or an independent who wants to be and, and be a part of the values that we're about, rather than trying to convince folks. Because these folks, many of them just don't want to be convinced. Uh, it's about safety for them, and, they, and about fear, being fear-based. And if we can show that love really does, and I know it sounds corny, love and abundance always um, trumps fear. And I'm, I'm sorry to use Trump, but it is true. It just does. Uh, then I think we can move the needle on it. Okay. Well, I mean, those. This is. I'm no expert on you know political demographic graphics and the and the answer specifically. However, I do think the thing that I was most encouraged by in the midterm elections is new leadership. I mean, Beto O'Rourke came a lot closer than he ever than every anyone ever thought he was going to come to defeat Ted Cruz. Um, Andrew Gillum came a lot closer to being governor of Florida than anybody thought. Stacey Abrams may still yet be governor of Georgia, God is willing. Um, Josh Harder, Josh Harder almost unseated in the Central Valley, you know, a toxic, venal member of Congress. And Steve King was unseated yeah. in Southern California, thank God. <laughs> Lorene Underwood won in Chicago, and nobody thought she was gonna win as a black woman. So they, they had the message. They had the message that appealed across difference, and you know they were they were very schooled. I mean, the Democrats finally, I do feel like, exercised some discipline around message. This is the thing that is lovely about our progressive rainbow, is that any time you want to say, only talk about this and this because these are the most important things, our response is, 
Fuck, I'll talk about whatever I want to talk about. I'm not going to listen to you. The right says, okay, got it down. Did I say it exactly right? Should I say it this way? Should I, did I do everything okay? So we, it's, it's, it's intrinsic that we will not be as disciplined on message because we are who we are and we love that. But when you have these young, younger folks who can win and we're not expected to win, they are show, they're going to show the way to leadership to, I think, be able to lead more effectively in the future and, be, and have more discipline around those messages and take that playbook. He got evangelicals to vote for him in Texas. Josh Harder got Central Valley evangelicals to vote for him. Stacey Abrams got evangelicals to vote for her in Georgia. What did they do and how did they talk about themselves? And as to this thing about the misinformation, this is where you know, I, again, I mean, maybe this is not the exactly right political perspective to take, but, but we, somebody has to take the rudder at, the, at Twitter and at Facebook to say, you are, you are not going to be allowed to post here if, you are, if your, your information is not verified and if you're trafficking in messages of hate. This yeah. is not, this yeah. doesn't, they, that does not have to be a democracy. They can stand on the street corner and say whatever they want, but they're not. They're not entitled to be on sources like that. And I do think we just have to take a much firmer hand that, or, or have them go through some matrix. And if they, if, they, if they are really a human person, yes, you can say whatever you want to say. But if there's this machine behind you, we're not going to allow you on our platform. You all are keeping in mind that there are faith um, communities where the leadership is female, people of color, and LGBTQ. And they're an important part of the, our, our overall movement. Um, and I want to make sure, I think you kind of answered that, that you are keeping those in mind. And that I'm tired of that uh, fundamentalist group's controlling conversation about Christianity. Even if you're not Christian or you are, they should be controlling the conversation. So can I just add two quick things? Um, I agree with all of that, and I just came from, I was just in Utah last week, uh, where I grew up, some of you know that, grew up Mormon in Utah, um, good girl gone bad, and, uh, and there was a, <laughs> yeah, good girl gone better, uh, so, uh, and it, the conference was at BYU, and it was called the Common Ground Conference, and we have convened it with the NCAA, and it's bringing together athletic directors and assistant athletic directors from Christian affiliated universities and colleges in conjunction with LGBTQ athletes at those colleges uh, to have a conversation about how they can make their programs more inclusive. We've done it four years in a row. We have 60 people there and it is transformative. And it, is, it goes to this point about talking across difference and recognizing these are people who, who many of them adhere to faiths where uh, my sexual orientation is an abomination. But they don't talk about that in the room but you can tell it's a struggle. But what they want and absolutely believe is that their LGBTQ athletes should be treated with respect and dignity and should be fully able to be out and who they are on their college campuses. So that conversation gives me hope that we can make headway here. And the other thing is, you know, we, I have not seen the number of bills I would have expected to see introduced and passed in the number of states that were threatening them. I think part of it is that the Supreme Court slapped it down a little bit with the cake baker case in Colorado where they didn't give them a full win. Um, we may see more. I don't think it will be as bad as we originally thought it was gonna be. I mean, obviously we'll be prepared to sue, but now we have a Supreme Court where we have to be really careful about that. So it could be difficult before it gets better, before we come out the other end of it, where another, a new generation of younger evangelicals care about climate change and care about human dignity and they don't care about who somebody has sex with. But being at BYU last week and having this conference gave me hope that there are voices, older voices, powerful voices within these denominations that say, well, no, 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 we need to treat people with respect and we shouldn't be engaging in discriminatory or harmful actions. Thank you. Um, I think I saw a question there, and I take another couple of questions. Uh, <coughs> yep. Coming right up. My heart is racing and the adrenaline's flowing because I know I'm bringing up a topic that is very, uh, you know, I didn't wear my bulletproof vest, so I'm kind of scared here. Um, as a white, privileged frat boy from the old, from, you know, I'm 73 now, so from the 60s. Um, what I'm 
I'm not even noticing it it's so much as just feeling it in the conversations that happen. It becomes a lot about us and them. And the them and the us seems to be white men against the rest. And I'm starting to feel in the conversations that all white men are the same and they're looked at the same often. So I just want to put a word in when I look at this, which there's no white men up here. Well, one, but not on the panel. But you don't count, Roger. <laughs> yeah, not on the panel. I, there kind of seems to be a lacking to me in the conversations of reaching out to a large part of the population, which is white men. Just because Trump is a president and Congress is mostly Republican, doesn't mean that all white men feel that way about things. And I've gone to meetings. Uh, recently I went to a transgender uh, discussion meeting where it was moderated by a lesbian. And I was sitting there as the only white man in the room. And I said something about transgender people and I was called out because it's transgender persons. And I went like, if you, if you hit on the allies that are trying to be out there that look like white men that are in Congress and Republican, just because of my skin and being a male and whatever, and we get pushed back at because of that, it makes it difficult to be an ally. And I understand that. So what I will say about that is, and that I know is an erosion of privilege, and no one wants to see their privilege eroded. And all I would say is, be courageous in that moment, and recognize that the erosion of your privilege is a level setting to make sure that other people can step into spaces don't feel shut down because people didn't feel like you used the right language. Use that, take that as a as a learning moment and still lean into that. Clearly you're showing up in places an as an ally and every white man here is showing up in places as an ally and every white man here cares about racial justice and the rights of transgender people and the rights of lesbians and women and the rights of women to be free from sexual harassment. We, we know that when you come into these rooms. So to the extent there's a correction or a challenging of you in any way that feels feels personal it's actually not personal it's really about trying to erode a white supremacist power structure that has existed for a very very long time and you have to be at the vanguard of eroding that because people of color and poor people and people who've been marginal are not going to be able to erode it themselves we need your help in eroding it but you really need to commit to eroding it and that sometimes means there will be that sometimes means there will be uncomfortable moments. So that's all I'll say. Be a champion. Be courageous. Don't sh don't pull back. Step in. That we feel privileged. That I don't know that that's always true. Well, what I'll say to that, and then we can move on to another question, is I know that white people, and particularly white gay men, white lesbians as well, um, suffer. Uh, particularly if you're poor, particularly if your parents rejected you and haven't spoken to you in decades. You have been marginalized, you felt degraded, you felt attacked, you felt threatened, maybe you've been physically harmed, but it's never been because of your race. The, you ha we have white privilege, those of us who are white. We, we will suffer, there's no doubt about that but we will never suffer because we're white. And it's, that's where the privilege comes from. That's what, that's what buoys up white supremacy, is that power structure will never be attacked based on race, but people of color face that every single day. So it's really just understanding that privilege operates whether you want it or not, and whether you suffer or not.
just one or two very quick questions, and I see a hand there, and I see a hand there. So I'm going to ask you to try a quick question. Type. And it was uh, my name is Jana, and I want to ask you. To, you mentioned people who choose not to vote, maybe as a political statement, um, and um, a friend of mine expressed that on Facebook that this was her choice, and that no one can tell her that that's not a valid choice. And yet there's, and, and I honor that, and at the same time there's this piece of me that's like, yeah, but if everyone like you voted, people like Gillum and Abrams could be in office, and that does make a difference. So I want to know maybe some ideas on how do you honor someone's choice, because I do think it is one of those things that um, demand respect, but at the same time, I really, those are people who already think the same way, we just, they don't think that their vote, in fact, they think abstaining makes a statement that will change the system. So. Thank you. And one more question here. one question over here. Okay, we're just living two questions, but I'm asking you to, you know, you know uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Hi, my name is Michelle Marzullo. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm a professor and I run a PhD program in human sexuality studies here in San Francisco and um, one of the things that I've noticed is that among um, Generation Z we see later sexual debut um, so people are losing their virginities at a later and later dates right they can blame lots of things including these <laughs> smartphones um, but also um, this idea that Generation Z frequently identifies as sexually fluid, not as LGBTQ in the alphabet soup. Um, so my question is really about generational organizing and whether or not and how your organizations are pulling in those folks who are kind of saying, hmm, I'm not down with this or identity organizing, but I'm really still interested in doing this cross-organizational um, work or, or cross-issue work. So just maybe to speak to that. Thank you. And I think there was somebody. Hi, uh, yes, uh, Kevin Franken. I was a federal employee uh, until two months until the Trump administration. He fired me for being gay. So I heard talk about how um, organizations are pulling back on federal litigation because of the judicial system. So I'm curious what your organizations are willing to do to help those of us who are still fighting and not willing to go back into the closet. Thank you. We have a question about voting, one about generational organizing, and thank you for sharing your personal uh, story and, and about what folks are doing. So uh, I can jump in on the generational organizing because I think that this is a situation where there is something to be learned from the global movement. Because obviously, internationally, we talk about the LGBTIQ, but of course, it's just an umbrella term. It's like the Fafafine in the Pacific Islands, they're not necessarily trans, but like, we can't be, I, I feel like it's important, we can't use sort of these identity labels in such a strict way, because it's like we need a common language, and it's like, I've. I've worked a lot with getting governments uh, on board in fighting globally for LGBTIQ rights. And so as soon as I find that there is like a bit of resistance, they often fall back on this, well, you know, it's hard, it's difficult, it's not the same everywhere in the world. It's not the same, being a woman is not the same everywhere in the world. But we can still use the term woman, and we sort of know what we mean. And I think that that's an important approach. Like, don't think of it as like these define exact labels that have to mean exactly the same thing. And I think if you focus on the issues, people can find a way to get involved. That's, that's my approach. Is that how your organization is going about it? Yeah, of course, because it's like, I mean, we talk about LGBTIQ issues, but like the people and the, the groups that we work with, they use a lot of, and of course, English is not their first language. It's like, you have to be inclusive. People know if they belong in this umbrella or not. Yeah, and I, I can just add quickly, um, and really actually echoing that. Um, so, so we have a, a project in partnership with the GSA Network called Truth, which is a trans or non-conforming youth-led uh, organizing, mobilizing kind of storytelling project that's national. Um, and and to your point, I mean, it's 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 very uh, like 
folk, the folks who are part of that identify in like so many different ways, right? But they know that this is about um, their identity, their ability to live their lives um, and to tell their stories. Um, and so I think it's just important to kind of have an open an openness around it. And just to also add like, and this was a while ago, I mean, this would have been like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago in New York when we were first starting up one of the first um, trans people of color organizing projects. Uh, when we would do like one of our largest events, we just left like an open kind of line for people to identify gender. And we would get like 75 different ways that people identified their gender. You know, so I think it's just important to be kind of expansive and open. Yeah. Any comments on, on uh, the oh. other questions, whether one about voting and also the gentleman who uh, shared about uh, his recent experience at federal, former federal employee? Yeah, uh, I'll say something about voting. On the youth thing, it, it's, for us, we orient our work um, grounded from treating people as whole people, right? And so, like with our national conference, we have a very, very high percentage of the people who come are Gen Z, sometimes with their parents. Um, and, the re and they come and they present, they're coming with their school groups, but they're coming because they're seeing their whole experience represented in some way, or, or much of it, I should, uh, at least. And so, and then they're bringing new language. Language will always be inadequate. We'll never have enough letters, right? But they're bringing their own language, and it's and it's incredible because then it helps other people. It resonates with people saying, "Oh, that yeah, that feels like me." So I think it's this kind of um, engagement. I've not experienced what you're describing, which is a, a lack of engagement or not wanting to be involved, um, based. Uh, and I, I don't want to change your words too much, but based on identity, what I see is uh, here. Here I am. All of me. I'm showing up with all of me, deal with me, and I want to be engaged and I want to lead. Um, on the voting thing, I, you know, everybody's got their own motivation. Of course they can choose not to vote. I have, I, I'm a little judgy around that, I will admit. But, um, but I actually, and I'm also the parent of a teenager, so I was reading this article about um, Gen Z and, and others who are coming into voting for the first time, some of whom are saying, well, I'm not going to vote because I don't want to be disappointed, or I'm not going to vote because I want to like stick it to the man or something. And I thought it was a great part of this uh, research that showed that, like, if you say to them, they don't want you to vote, <laughs> then they want to vote, right? So like, that's the they don't want us to vote. There, there is a systemic there. It there is voter suppression is so intense in this country right now. So I don't know. I mean, maybe that works for some yeah, doctors, but. <laughs> <laughs> And what I'll say on the federal employment thing, I mean, I know that the administration rolled back protections in federal contracting for LGBTQ folks. I was just saying to Ray, I don't recall them rolling back the protections generally for federal workers, and I might be wrong. So what I want to do is just give you my card, and smarter people at my office will figure out what if there's a claim here and what we can do, and we'll at least get you a decent answer about if, if we can help and how. I mean, we're definitely willing to still litigate cases. We're, I want to be clear, we're open for business, and we're suing the fuck out of that. <laughs> 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 I, I actually in light of that, that we're still suing. I, I, I just want to give credit to uh, Chris and Transgender Law Center. Uh, they, you sent out an email not long ago, um, which I particularly liked, and the title of it was, Still Here, Still Suing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to just pose sort of a you know, lightning you know, last question to everybody here, and, and that is that you know, everybody here in this room, by virtue of being here, has made a statement, as one of you was just saying before, about what you care about, and that you care about this community. And a lot of us express that in lots of different ways. We volunteer, and we do all kinds of things. And one of the things we do often also is, is, is to give money. And a lot of us give money at the end of the year. And so Horizons as a philanthropic organization, of course, we want to encourage that kind of behavior. Um, and I know that lots of people in this room are very generous. So from each of your perspectives, if you were to speak to people as donors thinking about what they might do toward the end of this year, in light of the world as it is now, what might be one thought that you would ask people you know, to, or suggest that people have in mind as they make their decisions? And I'm just gonna start as we began with, with Brad and just work my way this way. Yeah, I think it's also overwhelming for people that they don't know, you know, 
what to do. You're frozen with just this uh, onslaught of information. And I think of it oftentimes as like double dutch, and you just don't know where to jump in and how to get it going, but once you're in, you're in. And so I, I, I've been using the, the starfish uh, joke, for those of us who know the starfish, where the guy was on the beach, and there's about a million starfish that were on the beach. The guy walks up and says, and he's chucking them into the water, and the guy says, oh my god, what are you doing? There's like a, a million starfish on the beach. You're not making a dent in the world. And he picked up one and he threw it in, and he goes, I made a difference to that. And so the small ways in which you can give, give $25 and know that that $25 is really going to impact an organization and it allows us to leverage. Leverage is big. Remember business, you start with something small, uh, uh, market it properly, and you can create magnitudes of effect and impact in the world. So, so start with something small like a $25 gift or, or take $100 and divide it up into four and just know that you're doing the right thing and that small amount that you just did really is impactful and it has great magnitude to it. So, thank you. Well, I mean, I see a lot of our donors in the room, so thank you very much for, for supporting us. And, and for those of you who haven't thought about supporting global issues, I know for some people it seems vast. You know, there's a lot of countries, a lot of stuff going on in the world. But I want to encourage you to have a global mindset as well. And one of the reasons, among many, is that that's what the opposition is doing too. Alliance Defending Freedom, they're not just fighting in Colorado or around cakes or whatever. They're fighting around the world. They're sending Kim Davis, who, well, thankfully lost, they're sending her on tour to other countries to talk about how persecuted she is. So, like, we need to show up too. Like, that's, that would be my encouragement. Think, add global to whatever else you're doing. Thank you. Um, so my development director is working on the Stacey Abrams campaign right now, so I can do this without her yelling at me. Um, so, one, if you live here in the Bay, there's a number of organizations led by black and brown trans women, Ella Power Trans Latina, Transgender Intersex Justice Project, St. James Infirmary, um, and I really encourage folks to give to those orgs, because even in the Bay, um, some of our most targeted and vulnerable communities are really struggling. And then I would say go to the Trans Justice Funding Project website. Trans Justice Funding Project. You can either give to them directly or they have a map that has mapped out all the trans organizations all across the country. So these are orgs that like have no paid staff, are operating out of their cars. Like if you are not from the Bay and want to give to where you're from, your state, your hometown, there will be a trans org there and your $25 will go so far and mean so much to them. A uh, couple things, uh, Horizons and others did a uh, survey uh, to discover that very few members of our community give to our community. So find a giving buddy, or 10, or 100. But find someone who, for whatever reason, just hasn't taken the opportunity to give to an LGBTQ organization. And I really, I have some board members here and they hate when I say this, I don't care which organization. Fund to your values, fund local organizations, fund people of color led organizations, fund trans organizations. They're all important and we are all part of the same pie, but find some other people who haven't given and have a conversation with them about it. And if, and if they can give 25 bucks, if they can give 25,000, great. But bring others into the fold to support this movement because to Kate's point, we're gonna need it for the long haul. And um, I, I wanna say one more thing uh, that Kate doesn't know I'm gonna say and I don't think she's gonna say it herself. Um, Kate's leaving National Center for Lesbian Rights, which is very sad for all of us. Um, and unfortunately, one thing that sometimes donors do when an executive director leaves is they go, I'm going to wait to see what happens next before I write my check. Don't do that. <laughs> Fund National Center for Lesbian Rights. Fund organizations that are going to the I wasn't going to do it myself. Our organizations, <laughs> yeah, to say. Yeah, our organizations and leaders like Kate have built organizations that will sustain the work of this movement for decades to come. So don't slow down, speed up, and double down, and put your money where your values are. Well, thank you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, and th then what I'd say is that since I don't have to do a pitch for NCLR, um, <laughs> I, 
what I will say is is beyond is a little bit beyond the money and maybe pulling like 30,000 feet. Um, I know I've been on many panels with Chris and I've heard him talk about how our trans brothers and sisters are suffering and many of them dying. I've been on panels with Brett and heard this incredible discordance, uh, despicable as it is, of the disparities between infections for uh, white folks and uh, black folks with HIV. Um, I just met with folks from Outright yesterday, and I've known about Outright for many, many years when it was Eagle Herc, and understand how lethality that it is to be an openly LGBTQ person in many countries. And I know that every day we wake up and there's some new fresh horror happening in this country, and we woke up and saw it this morning. So what I want to just say and remind us all is this is a tough moment. It's a tough moment. There's no doubt about it. But you're here for a reason in this moment. You have a purpose here. You're not, it's not an accident that you're born right now. It's not an accident that you live through AIDS and help build organizations out of nothing. It's not an accident that some of you suffer through Jim Crow and now have seen, we were a long way to go, but still a much different country. It's not an accident that you're able to marry the person that you love, which was unthinkable 20 years ago. You're here because you're born for this moment. So whether it's money, whether it's volunteering, whether it's having difficult conversations, whether it's continuing to show up even when it hurts, even when it stings a little bit, that is your purpose, to live through this moment and to be able to say 10 or 20 years from now when your kids or your grandkids or your neighbor kids or your nieces or nephews or any young person says to you, holy shit, that was terrible. What did you do? You're gonna have an answer that, they're, that you're gonna be proud of and they're gonna be inspired by. Thank you, Kate. And, and I wanted to just conclude tonight uh, by noting that this wraps up our Q series for the year. Many people know Horizons Foundation mostly for the grants that we make throughout the community and across the country and even uh, some internationally as well. But what we also do is we bring community together in lots of ways and in lots of places. And one of the ways is through this Q series to look at a number of different topics. And traditionally, we've always ended the year with this kind of panel for the last, I don't know, 12 years or so, because the state of the movement is well and ever fresh topic. It's always different, it's always changing. And we have the enormous, enormous good fortune of being able to have such outstanding people as the folks who are here in front of us now. Uh, I am deeply grateful to all of you because what it's going to take for us is for all of us to be present. And we need, we need money and we need, we need organizing and we need vision and we need leadership. And what we are seeing here is a great deal of leadership. And so Brett and Maria and Chris and Ray and Kate, thank you for being here tonight. But more importantly, thank you for everything that you do for our community and the inspirations that each of you are. And I want to note, especially, and Ray, you beat me a little bit to it, but I did want to note that Kate has been perhaps our longest mainstay on this panel. I think you were part of the very first panel we had, which I believe was in the year about 2003, I want to say, in 2003. I think that the, 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 uh, the, the in some ways, the best State of the Moon panel we ever had was the year, what year was Lawrence? forgetting now. Well, 2003. It was 2003. Okay, that year we can claim full credit that they wanted to hand down the Lawrence decision to the Supreme Court so that we could talk about it at our event. Uh, but Kate has been a part of this event and has been such a leader in this movement. And I know you're probably not going to go all that far, but your run at NCLR has been absolutely extraordinary in history, in the history of this movement and the impact that you have had in so many ways will be enduring, and it is everywhere. And I just want all of us to offer you and everyone.
tremendous leadership, what movement means, as you've heard repeatedly here, and I think all of you know in your hearts already, is all of you. And all those other people that you touch and that you inspire. Because this is a hard moment. This is a difficult moment. And as we heard two years ago on this panel, right after the day after the 2016 election, what we heard was, you know what? We've been in places like this before. Not exactly this place. But we've been in hard places before. Many of us in the LGBTQ movement, the civil rights movement, and in so many other movements. And we made it to today, and we're going to make it to another day, and we are going to wind up with our movement where we want it to be, and where, all, how, where we have always deserved to be all along, free and equal in this society and across the world. So thank you all so very much uh, for coming tonight and for everything that you do.